start a whole new series uh, this week called Strapped. It's this idea of sort of being uh, kind of strapped down by our financial debt and by the things that uh, we get caught up in. Uh, but right off the bat, I want to say this is a no guilt sermon. I'm not trying to back the truck up and dump a bunch of guilt on any of us. Yes, have you looked at your credit card statements yet since Christmas? Don't do it. It's, uh, if you flew anywhere, if you have any uh, purchases, you know, that are still on your card and you're thinking, man, I feel strapped. That's what this sermon's about. This is for you. Let me pray and we will look at God's word. God, we start a new year. We come into this year, Lord, looking to uh, be an offering and a blessing to you. We look to glorify Jesus this year in all that we say and we think and we do. God, may our lives be a light that glorifies you and shines the light of Christ into the world. Right now, we're going to talk about money, the whole idea of being strapped down by debt and difficulties. God, would you bless this sermon Move past the whole issue of money. Move to a place where we feel our dependency and our need for you. Move in us now. Speak to us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you start 2016, do you have resolutions? Do you have these uh, ideas of things you want to do? Nobody does that anymore. My wife and I said we want to read more books and take more walks together. We want to at least have something that we sense we're accomplishing uh, together in our marriage. I think another thing that would be a resolution would be to get out of debt. Don't you think? Uh, don't raise your hands. <laughs> but how many of us live under some kind of financial debt, some kind of burden, and we are underneath this and you can barely breathe? You look at your credit card statement every month and you just shake your head, oh, why am I still in this? Maybe another question to ask is, how many of you would want more money if you could get it? Four people. Really? All right. How many of you don't have enough money? The same four people. Okay, well, uh, I think all of us have this idea where we want a little bit more money. We want to pay off the thing. Next week, we're going to talk about um, sort of a, an, another way of sort of how to get out of debt. Practical steps of learning to save and invest in that. Uh, the, some of the stuff comes from Dave Ramsey, the whole the, the money guy. He has this incredible series, Financial Peace University. And a lot of the stuff comes out of that. But I'm going to dig into scriptures a little bit deeper and look at the spiritual side of how money can sort of lord over us, but we need to serve God. So pay attention as we look at some scriptures. Proverbs 22, verse 7. This is from King Solomon himself, one of the wealthiest men who ever lived in the entire world. He said this, The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. This guy was so wealthy, he had more people serving him and, and living underneath him. He knew the idea of how money can oppress people. Solomon was the guy who almost invented money in a sense. He's the guy that he started taxing the roads around him all throughout Israel. So anybody who would travel anywhere, they had to pay the toll tax. They had to pay the, the road tax in order to get anywhere. And this guy was making money upon money upon money. And he said that the poor serve the rich. I looked up the word servant this week. The Hebrew word for servant is abed or, a, or abed. And what it means is someone who is a slave to a master, someone who is in bondage to somebody else or something else. Um, and as we look at this, I wonder if you know if you're a slave to money or not. Do you know if you're a slave to money? Some of us are a slave to money and we don't even know it. Here is how you might know if you're a slave to money. One way would be you would say to yourself, I want to get married, but I just can't afford it. I, I want to have kids. I want to have more kids in my life. I just don't know how I'm going to pay for them. I want to go to school. I just don't want to go into debt. I don't want finances to be my problem. I want to buy that thing. I want to change my job. I'm not making enough money in my job. I want a different job because I want more money but I just can't 
change. I want to help on a mission trip. I want to serve other people by giving them money. I just don't have any money to give them. Sometimes we get caught under this slavery of money. We let it sort of control us as our master instead of us saying, I'm going to control my finances. Dave Ramsey says a few statistics. He says the average American household debt in the U.S. is 136% of its income. Yeah, I know. These are old statistics too. For those who carry a balance, the average credit card debt is $14,500. The average. So there must be people that have more. Uh, the average 21-year-old has a $12,000 debt. And by the time they're 28, their debt is $78,000. I talk to a lot of college kids that are like, I don't know why I'm going to school. I'm just getting so in debt. I don't know how I'm ever going to graduate. And how am I going to carry this into my, my next stage of life? Uh, the average number of U.S. households living paycheck to paycheck is 55%. They can't even save anything, and if they lose their job, then they lose their rent money, then they lose their house, and then they lose, they lose, they lose. They, we just are a people that live under this idea of being strapped. And this is a global thing. People live under debt in the whole entire World. One of my friends is in Seattle. He pastors a church out there, and he started a, a nonprofit agency called One Day's Wages. And he said for a few dollars, some people live a whole day on a few dollars. And he started this nonprofit fundraising thing of having Americans who make more than a dollar a day giving some of their money toward these poorer countries that need it and deserve it so much more than us. But we say we have house payments and car payments and college debt and we have to pay off our credit cards and we live strapped. But I don't think that's what God desires. Do you? Do you think God cares about money? Do you think God, what do you think God thinks about money? If you read the scriptures, if you read the scriptures on a regular basis, you would know that two-thirds of all the parables Jesus ever told were concerning money. In fact, in my devotion this morning, I read in Matthew 13, you know the parable of the sower? What happened to the, the seeds that were thrown on the thorny ground? Do you remember what happens? Listen to this verse. It says, since they had no root, they lasted only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorn refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it out. Do you know that money is corruption? Money, the love of money is corrupting. In the Gospels, one in every 10 verses has a discussion of money. There's a talk about money. Jesus talked about the, the parable of the servants. Jesus talked about the parable of uh, people who were in debt, the, the man who owned these slaves. And you know what I mean? Jesus would say things, almost every one in every 10 verses in the Gospels is about money and freedom and getting out of debt. You know there are 2,300 verses in the Bible about money. It's crazy. Five times as many verses about money than prayer and faith. There's more talk about money in the Bible than anything. It's amazing. So we as believers who walk in this consumer, uh, this culture of consumerism, this American sort of idealism, we live under debt. A lot of us do, and... That's not God's freedom designed for us. So let's talk about the temptation of money and possessions and things and all that, especially right after Christmas where now all the gifts are opened and all the kids know what you got them and there's this, uh, there's this great pleasure and wow, this was amazing to give to my kids and then we look at our credit card statements and go, oh, what am I doing? Here's number one. We're so tempted to serve money. We tend to serve money. People serve money. They're servant to or slave to money. And here's a scripture Jesus said in Matthew 6. No one can serve two masters at the same time. You know this verse well. 
Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. A lot of us in here want to serve God. We want to put God first in our life, and yet we find that we're actually serving money instead of God. How many of you ever bought something you didn't need? You might be serving money rather than God. How many of you uh, have hoarded things and not given them away? Yes, me too. I might be serving money rather than serving God. Um, how many of us have ever tried to fight to move up the corporate ladder and become, you know, get the better job, the better office, the better uh, vacation spot, the better everything, and at the expense of my family, at the expense of my wife and kids, and you might be serving money if that's your goal. Uh, the problem with money is that we seek to be more happy with more money, but we find ourselves more in bondage to serving it. I wish this all came out of my head. This is all just coming out of Scripture. Number two would be we're tempted to love money. We serve money and we love money more than sometimes we love God. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, it says, For the love of money is the root of all evil. The love of money, not money, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. I tell you, sometimes the more money you have, the more of a life of grief you have, the more pieces you gotta piece together, strings you have to tie, things you have to keep track of. Yes, money's good, it's fun to have money if you have some money, but it's also can be frustrating and hard and difficult to manage it all and keep it together. It's not the money, money isn't good or bad. Money is just an object, it's just money. But it's the love of money. I know people that are very, very wealthy and they don't love their money, they're just a lot of money. I know people that are very, very wealthy and they love their money and they push people aside. They do things to walk over people and hurt. Do you know any of those kind of people? Where money is their God. They're serving money. They love money. But we tend to think if I have a little more money, then I could retire and have more peace. How many of you are retired and you're like, I don't know where any peace is, <laughs> right? Some of us think, if I had more money, I wouldn't have to work as hard. I could get out of debt. I could give more money away to more people. I'm telling you what, it's not about the money. Because the truth is, the more money you have makes you more of what you already are. So if you're a jerk already, then you'll just be a jerk with more money. You'll be mean to people. You'll try to get more money. But if you're generous with money already, even though you don't have any, and you get more money, you'll be extra generous. You'll be even more generous to other people because it's from your heart. It becomes a heart issue. It's the love of money that's the root of all kinds of evil. How do you know if you love money? I already asked you if you wanted more money. Only four of you raised your hand, so maybe the rest of us are okay. No, I'm just kidding. But we gotta be very careful because it's a heart issue, the Bible says. In fact, in Ecclesiastes, again, this is King Solomon. He says, whoever loves money never has enough money. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless King Solomon said, meaningless, life is meaningless. And then the pursuit of money is even meaningless. Problem is we watch TV, we look at corporate America, we look at how money can tend to satisfy the short term of people. It still leaves that empty spiritual hole without God. Many of us are under money's power and we don't even know it. Here, here's the real issue. It's not the amount of money that you make, it's the amount of money that you spend, right? It's the idea of I gotta just spend more to feel more happy. I gotta put this on the credit card. All of a sudden, I've got these life problems. It's not about my income. It's about my heart issue, my center with God, my spiritual issue. It's about the Lord. 
Some people say, if only I had more money, it would solve these problems. Really, it doesn't solve problems. It just makes you more in debt, and problems compound even more than that. So here's the deal. Are you tired of being strapped? Are, are those of us, the three or four of us in the room, are you tired of feeling under debt? Like, I can't get out from underneath this. Well, God has a perspective about money. Godly perspective on money is this. Money serves us as we serve God. And I'm going to tell you how that works. How does money serve us as we serve God? One of them, one way is to uh, use it as a tool to bless others in Jesus' name. Don't use it as a tool to bless yourself, to gain more something, more income for you, more comfort, more cushion around you. Use it as a way to bless others. This is a way to let money serve you as you serve God. Give it away. I don't think I have this on the screen, but in Matthew 6 it says, Jesus said, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy but store up for yourself treasures in heaven, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. How do you know if you want more money? It's where your heart is. I gotta have that next thing. Gotta have the next gadget. You know my problem with my iPhone? Is that Apple, every six months, comes out with the next thing. And I gotta have the next thing. And then I find myself not happy with what I have. I have to learn to trust God and bless others. Here's another way is to not compare yourself to other people. Aren't we a country that compares ourselves to other people? Look at that guy's car. Well, look at that guy's job. Well, look at that person. She has this and he has that. And all of a sudden we find ourselves comparing to other people. And here's the problem. In today's world, we compare ourselves to our parents who have the house or our grandparents who finally have their mortgage paid off. And, you know, they're 30 years ahead of us or so. And you think, I want to have that thing right now. Comparison is a killer. I think comparison is the work of the devil, to be honest. Did you hear about the Texas rancher? who went to Europe on vacation. And, and I hate to pick on any of you that, that are from Texas, but it's, the word humble doesn't come to mind when I think of Texas, let's just say that. And a lot of ranchers in Texas will think, I got the biggest ranch in the world. And so this Texas rancher goes to Europe. And he goes to England and he sees a bunch of stuff and he heads his way up to Scotland and he starts seeing these big fields in Scotland, these big ranches, if you will. And he meets this farmer and he says he, he, he wanted to find out if the farmer would ask him how big his ranch was in Texas. So he prompted the question and he said, sir, how big is your ranch here in Scotland? And the rancher said, well, I got about 10,000 acres. He didn't talk like that. Probably talk more Scottish. I got about 10,000 acres and it's about this big and I have this much land. And then, of course, the follow-up question was, well, Texas rancher, how much land do you have? How big is your property? And the Texas rancher says, well, I can get up, sun up. Before the sun comes up, I can get in my truck and I can start driving west. And before the sun goes down in the west, I can still be driving on my property. It's that big. And the Scottish rancher said, well, I used to have a truck like that one time too. <laughs> I think sometimes we fall into comparison and we want to compare our stuff to other people's stuff and we lose track that money is there to serve us as we serve God. It's a tool that we use that can bless others. Look at what Jesus said in Luke 12. Jesus said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist of the abundance of of his possessions, the abundance of his things. Your life consists of who you are, how you walk with God. I don't know if you get the privilege of going to a lot of funerals. I call it a privilege because as a pastor, I get to serve people by blessing a family in their funeral. You know what I've never seen at a funeral? A U-Haul parked outside with all of that person's stuff. Have you ever seen that? Have you ever seen a casket bigger than six feet long or eight feet long and three feet wide? Have you ever seen a humongous casket that had room for more stuff? I never have either. And so you can't take it with you when you go. 
Sometimes we get so caught up in that. Let me tell you a few more statistics from Dave Ramsey. He says 700,000 Americans have signed up for a credit card that has interest rates of more than 56% on the card. I know. 50% of Americans have less than a month of emergency savings. So they're living paycheck to paycheck. People spend 12 to 18% more when they use a credit card. It's a lot easier to click on Amazon and spend a couple more dollars, right? Um, here's, a, here's an interesting one. You can save $112,000 over your lifetime by bringing your lunch to work in a brown paper bag. You can save $100,000 by not going out to lunch every day. 95% of married couples argue regularly about money. 95%? That's all of us. We argue about money with our spouse. The number one cause of divorce in America is financial related. My daughter's a sophomore in high school, and she's taking this economics class. And in the class, each one was assigned to get married and have like a kind of pretend life for a while. And my daughter wants to go to this college out of state and this kid want this other boy wanted to be a doctor and went to medical school and we'll just say that their debt compounded and by the time the class was over they decided to get a divorce he decided to divorce her and it was like made known in the class and the teacher said why are you getting divorced so quick and he said because she wants to go to this school and the debt's going to be you know a hundred thousand dollars and boom just and it was pretend it wasn't even real Here's another one. The average American has over $38,000 in consumer debt. These are tough, tough statistics. Before we go, I want to break down 1 Timothy chapter 6. I want to talk to you about what Paul is actually telling Timothy and why he's instructing his church on how we should live financially. Verse 5 is really the key to the whole thing, and I don't have it on the board, but 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 5, people who have a corrupt mind, who have been robbed of the truth, and who think that godliness is the means of financial gain. Godliness is not a means of financial gain. It's a means of getting close with God. And here's where Paul takes the lead in verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of the world. And if we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. Let me remind you that Paul is writing this from prison. He's in a prison cell, this carved out rock quarry, and there's bars, and he's sitting there with a few clothes on, writing about contentment. Verse 9, people who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. We wander away from the faith. Look at this. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Let me pause for a minute. Why are we talking about money on January 3rd? Why, why are we in this church talking about finances? Other than that that's what most of Scripture talks about, freedom, freedom from debt, freedom from an economic uh, being strapped. Here's the reason why. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. One of my lifetime theme verses. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. What's the pattern of this world? Consume, being in debt, all that, you know, I need more. I got to have something that satisfies me. God says, don't be conformed to that, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Understanding that God has renewed your mind. God in Christ has taught you new things and is teaching you to shape your mind different. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. Some people ask me, Pastor, I don't know God's will for my life. I don't know the direction my life is supposed to go. And I wonder if their mind has been transformed by the world conformed to the world or transformed by the will of God and I and I wonder if their mind is being transformed in Christ so they can hear God's plan for them 
Why am I talking about money on January 3rd? Is because we have more days to go this year and are we gonna be consumed and trapped by money and be slave to money? Or are we gonna be transformed in our mind and serve Christ? You know, it's the reason we take communion on a monthly basis here in the church. Because on the night that Jesus was betrayed and he took bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples, he said, this is my body which is given for you. And in the same way, after the meal, he took the cup and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. As often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you remember my death until I come again, Jesus said. The whole point of our Christian faith is not to get caught up in consumerism and caught up in debt and get caught up in what the world desires, but to be caught up in the life of Christ and the free gift that God gives us. There's no debt to be paid anymore with God. We sang about it. The debt has been paid. Our sins have been forgiven. We have life and freedom with God in Christ. So I encourage you this morning as you come to the table to receive uh, the gifts of God for his people that we would put aside our debt for God and we would say, Lord Jesus, come. Father, we now enter this time of being at the table. We thank you that you invite us into your presence. I pray for those here, God, who have a burden of sin, a burden of debt before you. God, remind them again they are forgiven in Christ. Remind them again, God, the blood of Christ washes them. They are made new and renewed in you. We come to this table, Father, to receive that free gift of grace from you. Join us now, Lord, as we enter into this moment and remember the very death of Christ and his resurrection for us that we might have new life in you. We pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please come when you're ready. Be encouraged. Uh, not feeling under a snowball of debt or under this, oh man, pastor talked about freedom in the Bible and I don't have any freedom. Here's my prayer is that whether you're in debt or not, whether you need money or not, whether you have a bunch of money and can bless others, here's the deal. God is sovereign and he loves us and he provides for us. Sometimes our circumstances don't look very hopeful, but God is a God who provides and provides victory and grace and care to us. No matter what you're facing, God is with us. Amen? We receive the blessing this morning. In our church, we do a tradition with our hands like this. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, both now and forevermore.